As Carl instructed you, you can check the screen for the backgrounds of today's speakers. Leslie Glustrom, Amy Oliver Cook, and Peter Lilienthal. Together, they bring us a discussion not only of an innovative idea for how we can meet the need for sustainable energy, but also people on the opposite ends of the political divide can find common ground and partnership. It is something we model at Rotary, and it is gratifying to see this example of cooperation in a highly charged political issue. Whew, who wrote that second sentence? Our speakers. <laughs> Leslie, Amy, and Peter, please come on up. So uh, thank you for inviting me and having me here today. I am here and, and friends with Leslie because she is relentless. <laughs> uh, many of you probably know that, but uh, we obviously come from different sides of the political spectrum, right? Uh, and just in case you're wondering, I actually live in Weld County and do work for John Caldera, so some of you may know him. Um, yeah, I, I feel like I do it so that nobody else has to. Um, at least work for Caldera. No, um, um, I, Leslie and I started, we, we, we met at, of all places, the, the PUC. Um, Public Utilities Commission. And again, that's one of those things that we do so you all don't have to. It, and what we found is that rather than spend time on, on what we disagree on, there is something that we agree on. And we're gonna focus on that. And so I start with, we start with this premise that um, freedom, affordable power, a clean environment and energy development are not mutually exclusive. We can have all of those things. And, and when we started talking in that, in that way, we came to the realization that there's something that we agree on and it's this thing, microgrids. And microgrids would appeal to the free market capitalist because it puts people in charge. You're in charge of your own, of your own power. You get to choose. There are states where people can choose their power providers. We don't have that kind of a state. We have a regulated monopoly that, that um, and you get, you know, you buy power from them. Um, there are co-ops and, and things like that, but but we purchase power from a regulated monopoly. But what if we put people in charge? What if we put you in charge? And so when we started, started looking at that, there, there are things that appeal to sort of my side of the aisle, which would be um, the freedom aspect. There's also an economics aspect to this. And that if we're going to go to this transition, and, and that's clearly where the state is headed. We have some state lawmakers in the room. We have the mayor of Boulder in the room. This is the direction the state is headed it, towards either zero carbon emissions or 100% renewable, however you want to frame that. I, I mean, I prefer to use zero carbon emissions because it includes um, it could include nuclear, and if, you're, if, if, if emissions are your thing, you could, include, you could include nuclear in that. But if that's where we're headed, what's the most economic way to get there? I mean, Boulder's looking at that right now, right? With your, you're trying to figure, figure that out. Um, well, I've seen some preliminary numbers, and if that's where we're headed, the, the cost is going to be big, and we have to accept that there is going to be a cost to it. Yes, um, we have seen the price of wind and solar drop, but it's still going to be expensive. We also have an entire national grid that needs either, 
a lot of maintenance or we have to, at this natural transition point, we have to come up with what is the next thing. And as Leslie and I talked, where do we, where do we agree? Microgrids, whether it's the size of Boulder or whether it's my next door neighbor. And maybe my next door neighbor and I decide that they're going to have either a generator or solar panels or whatever, and I'm going to invest in the batteries, and we're going to share back and forth. We should be able to do that. We should be able to have the freedom to power or to generate our own power within our own homes. And you know what? With technology, control it. We have an entire series that the Independence Institute has written on microgrids. Here's the thing about it. You know who really loves it? Young people. Our series was written by, by two guys under the age of 22. This peer-to-peer -peer network, energy, electricity sharing, seems natural to them. So we're some of us who are old and we, we, we sometimes struggle thinking outside the box. These guys totally get it. They're like, well, yeah, what if, what if I have a house and my neighbor has, they have a house and somebody else does and we all decide to get together and do our own thing. And, and it also has an environmental aspect to it as well. Because one of the things I think we need to acknowledge is that uh, utility scale solar and wind take up a lot of land. If that land is not available, or if we choose to do other things with it, it makes much more sense to be able to do this all in our own homes. The other thing, and this will appeal to my side of the aisle, grid security. Very hard to take down, oh, I don't know, 100 million, 150 million little microgrids versus one centralized grid one centralized grid that would be a target for anybody who might want to, to harm us. And last thing, and I'll leave you with this, because then you, you, the really important people are coming up in just a second. Um, there is a social cost to not having electricity. Have any of you read Five Days at Memorial Hospital? If you haven't read it, great book. It's all about what happened at Memorial Hospital during Hurricane Katrina and right after. There is a social cost to not having electricity. If we can control our own and we aren't relying on a central grid, or maybe, maybe we just have one central grid as a backup, as the emergency. Imagine if we can control our own and then we have an emergency backup. That's grid security. We haven't put our eggs all in one basket. So there is a way for right and left to come together on this, on the issue of how do we power our economy going forward. And from my perspective, it's on microgrids. Please go to the Independence Institute, thinkfreedom.org. We have five different columns about this very thing. So we can have freedom, we can have affordable power, we can have a clean environment and develop our resources responsibly. They're not mutually exclusive. Thank you for having me here today. Awesome. I'm Leslie Glustrom, and you might have heard of this guy named Merrill Glustrom, and he probably had something to do with getting me here. But uh, So I'm just the very quick bridge, because both Amy and I, really believe strongly in trying to open up markets for more innovation and more competition. And one of the ways to do that is to allow more of these microgrids. We have a world-class expert here, uh, Peter Lilienthal, who's going to be here to talk to us actually in a very short amount of time. He works all over the world. He's been doing it for a very long time. People all over the world want him as their keynote speaker. So. I don't want to stay here too long except for that to really underscore what Amy said about opening up these markets. We're in the 21st century, and the old concepts from the 20th century 
left and right and it's polar and it's bi, you know, there's only two solutions. Those are clearly not working anymore. So we've got to find a way to move beyond that. And I, as I said, when Amy and I began doing this work together, I said, it was like our marriage, right? You know, <laughs> um, we've been married 41 years and I'm a very happily married woman. And I hope <laughs> if Meryl's suffering, he's doing it graciously. Um, but uh, <laughs> Uh, if he would just recognize that I was right all the time, that everything, no, I'm just kidding. Obviously, neither of us are right. It's the same in our country. We are one nation, indivisible. We've got to take that seriously. And while we can't always affect what happens in Washington, we can in our lives and in our local situations do this kind of work. So I thought rather than have me try to talk about microgrids, I, since we had access to Peter who work, lives and works here in Boulder, we would just turn it over to Peter to give you the professional sense of what this microgrid, why are we talking about microgrids? So thank you again for having all three of us. We're very grateful. Yeah, thank you, Leslie, for that introduction. And I, it's a real pleasure to be here. I've never been to the Rotary Club before, and I wasn't aware of your, your um, what do we call, I forgot what you call it, the four, the four points. And, and I'm, we're not, this isn't a political discussion, but I have to say, I, I really love the four points, and our political world would be so much better off if, if all the politicians loved those four points. <laughs> and as both Speakers said, we're in this transition from, from on those two pictures. I'm going to try to be really quick about this, but it's really because of technology's improved. Solar and storage have really improved dramatically. Solar especially, storage is in the middle of that. So there's a real flux happening in, in, this, in those storage technologies now. And communication control, that's just electronics. Actually, the utility industry is a little slow to pick that up. Um, but that just erases the advantage of centralized plants. So, so the utility industry was built around those big thermal plants that have economies of scale that really need to be built big. Nobody builds a small coal plant. Um, and so if you have big plants, you have to have a centralized system, and that's how the industry developed. But technologies we have today are not inherently centralized. They're inherently modular, and that changes the whole game. And this is a global phenomenon. You know, we're thinking about Boulder and Colorado and whatnot. It's really a truly global phenomenon, and it's even more true in developing countries, which is actually where we work more, frankly, and where this idea of microgrids is really sort of reverse technology transfer, because it's, it's been happening in developing countries first, um, and now it's coming here. Um, so I like to talk about the six Ds of our energy future. Distributed, we already mentioned. Decentralized, we already mentioned. But I want to focus on the democratized, right? And that's sort of what Amy was getting at. And it's really, you know, if you have a centralized technology, you end up with a centralized industry, a centralized economy, actually a centralized power structure. And likewise, if, if, if our technology is decentralized, the whole, everything else becomes decentralized, including power structures as well. At least I believe that. Diverse, I think, is really important. I mean, solar is going to really take over, but it's not going to be the only solution. There's wind, <coughs> and the traditional technologies are not going to go away quickly. So we, diversity is a, is a powerful uh, um, concept for robustness, et cetera. The digitized part makes it all possible, and decarbonized is kind of what's motivating a lot of this. So those are our six Ds, I like to say. Um, this is kind of a complicated slide, and I try to make it quick, but, but uh, people talk about the smart grid, and of course we were supposed to be the smart grid city, right? And, um, and, but, but really relying on large utilities to, do, to be innovative, and I don't mean this as a, as a, as a you know, insult to, to large utilities. Their job is to keep the lights on. They have a really complicated system. The, the grid, the national grid, is the most the largest and most complicated machine ever built. It's a single machine that stretches across the whole continent. And it, it's, it's mind-boggling that it actually works. And their job is to keep it working. And they live in a really regulated environment. They have security issues, as Amy mentioned, about you know the um, cyber attacks and whatnot. Um, whereas meanwhile, on small grids, and we've worked in little, We've worked all over on, on tiny grids in remote areas and, and islands, et cetera. You can be innovative there. And I love this story. 
And it's a fellow Boulderite, actually, well, was one of the real um, uh, people that made this happen. Um, this Eskimo village in western Alaska, really, really remote, maybe 100 homes. They put up two wind turbines. Suddenly, they're high penetration renewables. And they've got a wireless network controlling individual appliances, individual homes, going up and down with the wind, keeping a stable grid with just load control, wireless network. That's the smart grid, and it was happening in a, and, and we have examples like that all over the world in really remote places like this. Eskimo Village, Western Alaska, incredibly remote place. Whoops, sorry. Um, and that's the, the route to the um, uh, smart grid, and it's because they have to burn, they have to rely, the alternative for them is diesel, diesel fuel, and so that's, the economics of this is much more compelling on small, uh, in these remote areas. So that's where it got started. This is what it, it kind of looks like as an example. Um, I'm gonna move on just for time reason. There's really three value propositions here. Reliability, uh, and that's you know emergency services. The military is one of the real leaders here. That's the one counterexample to the target issue. So, th so they actually worry about tar uh, cyber security a lot, um, whereas most microgrids really don't need to worry about that. In the remote areas, um, like islands, and it's, energy access stands for the billion people in the world that have nothing, that are, have no access to energy. They'll walk 10 miles to get their, charge, their cell phone charged. That, that's a huge market that, w that we really focus on. And that's really all about saving money. And then eventually I do believe the environmental and carbon uh, issue is the most, is the strongest. It's getting, it's a little political, et cetera, but it's, I, I think that eventually will be the biggest driver. And then all of these different um, um, markets or applications have sort of a different mix of those value drivers. So what did, what, what, what did we do? We looked, I mean, we got started a long time ago doing this, and we looked around and said, wow, there's too many choices. There's these old technologies, traditional technologies, a bunch of new technologies, and, and um, you know, people want to know what is best. Uh, and the answer is it really depends, which is not the, the answer people want to hear. Um, uh, you know, you want a cookie cutter, you know, one size fits all sort of Model T kind of solution. But it really does depend on what are the resources, like Alaska, Western Alaska is pretty windy, most of the world is very sunny, et cetera. Um, what do you need energy for? What are your reliability requirements? What, what are your load profiles, you know, daily and seasonal? And the technology keeps changing. It's getting better, which is great, but it just adds to the confusion. And, and if any of their salespeople in the audience, a confused mind says no. So we created this software to help people fit those pieces together. Um, and this is a, you know, yet just the inputs, it does simulation, does optimization. I won't go into our software in a lot of ways. Lots of results. What is your return on investment? How is this thing going to operate? When do you need backup generation? When do you charge and discharge batteries? This is actually a half hour slot presentation in its own right, so I'll just move on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and we started doing this back in 1992 at NREL. It was really just a research project then because the technology really wasn't ready. Uh, but 10 years ago, we spun off and created Homer Energy as a private company. We've been doing it all over the world. Um, this, and you can see examples of some. We have uh, 70,000 projects in our database. This is just the commercially viable ones. Uh, but still, they're all over the world. Um, we've got a huge database. Uh, I'm not going to brag anymore. But we're very proud of what we've done. Um, and we have lots of uh, uh, companies that we work with. We're putting on a, a conference, our seventh annual, this little, this, I am gonna do a little plug for our seventh annual Homer International Microgrid Conference. We did it a couple years ago in Denver, but this time it'll be in Cambridge, Mass. Um, so that's, we bring people from around the world to talk about microgrids. And one of the goals here is to, is to connect people together. So we deal with renewable advocates who wanna talk about 100% renewables. And we deal with utility operators who are scared to death of that whole concept. And this is Mars and Venus, really. And then we also deal with power engineers who have very sophisticated uh, software uh, that doesn't consider economics at all. It's considered, uh, you don't even want to hear what all kinds of ec power engineering stuff that they worry about. Uh, but it's complicated stuff. And the finance community has their spreadsheets, which are also pretty complicated, but don't consider any of the technical constraints. So we sit in the middle. We have a, I, I our goals have a tool that all these people can use. 
and get around a table and speak a common language and come to an agreement about what the project should look like and how to move forward. So we view it as a communication tool as well, in addition to just being an analytic tool. So that's, that's it, I'm, um, you know, more pr promotion. But um, we've been doing microgrids for a long time, when, and just like the, both Amy and Leslie said, this, we do think this is the future, and it's the way to democratize and uh, decentralize and bring in clean energy and do it in an affordable, reliable way. So that's, that's it. Well, I want to thank both these people. They're both incredibly busy people, and Amy has just a huge amount going on in Weld County, including a family reunion, and Peter literally is wanted all over the world. If you saw the map with all those dots, all those people want him. <laughs> and so he's trained a lot of people to help them, but he has really just helped pioneer this technology. And although he works all over the world, his company is based here in Boulder. It's a typical example of kind of a, an offshoot from all of our scientific work here in Boulder. And then just creating jobs and creating a future that isn't right or isn't left, but starts to give us 21st century solutions. And you know, I listen to webinars and hear examples from all over the country. So um, they've both been very brief, which is kind of a trick when you have three speakers. So I think we'd be happy to take any questions or any comments or, uh, yes, and somebody probably knows how to do this that I don't. I think your microphone is coming. Now I won't have to speak so loudly. Uh, Leslie, thank you so much uh, for being here with your colleagues. Um, it may sound like a, a kind of a simple question, but I honestly don't know what a microgrid is. I wonder if one of you or all of you yeah, would speak to what a microgrid is, how it works, what are the various uh, types of microgrids? Yeah, sorry, I, I went over that slide and I, I, I was trying to rush too much, uh, but that's an important question. Uh, and, and how does it differ from just putting solar on your roof? Right? A lot of people have rooftop solar, but if, if all you have is rooftop solar, when the grid goes down, you go down. It doesn't, it doesn't provide any backup for your reliability for you at all. So uh, in order to do that, you need, it needs to be a hybrid. It needs to have something else. It needs to have batteries or a backup generator, and then it becomes what we call a hybrid power system. And so there's lots of different definitions of microgrids. I like a really simple one that is a system that's capable of standing on its own. So, if, so the rooftop solar, if that's all it is, isn't a microgrid because it can't stand on its own. But if you have batteries and the right kind of power electronics and switch gear, et cetera, uh, then when the grid goes down, you can stand on your own. And it's becoming more and more common. Um, and it's, and the, the leaders are kind of in the US, the leaders in the developing world. In the US, it's the military and so campuses, uh, Princeton, NYU, Wesleyan, um, UC San Diego, um, it's getting, becoming more and more common now. How, how, is I, how can I, as an individual, participate in a microgrid? I imagine the University of Colorado has a microgrid. Other companies probably have microgrids. So, so that's a great question, and I was going to add something to this, and this involves public policy, which some of you know, the lawmakers in the room, you'll remember this, this bill that was passed last year. So, for instance, my next door neighbors, two of them have solar, have solar panels. They have pan rooftop solar. Um, I would love to be the neighbor that invests in battery backup. And if the three of us then got together and, and, and shared that, say, the grid goes down, we could be our own little microgrid. Uh, and in fact, in Colorado, uh, thanks to the Colorado State Legislature, last was I think it was last year. It was it, we are the first state to pass the right to store. So you have the freedom to store your own power via battery backup without interference from a regulatory agency or the or, or the utility. So, so you could do, you could have your own, or you could get with your neighbors, and you might include for right now a natural gas generator or something else. I think it's the military actually has started doing like two megawatt, or maybe it's 10 megawatt 
nuclear reactors that they can put up in just a, a few, like in three days. So anyway. The simple answer is if you have rooftop solar, just get batteries and you might need a slightly different inverter. The more complicated answer, as Amy alluded to, is there's all kinds of regulatory issues. And, and it varies from state to state. And because we work internationally, I'm not as familiar with state regulation as maybe you guys are. But, but in, in every state's a little different. Some states you're not allowed to sell power. Only the utilities allowed to sell power. Some states you're not allowed to run a wire across a right of way. There's all kinds of policy initiatives that could help a lot. Yeah, that's such a, you can see we like your question, so thank you so much. Um, it really gets to the heart of the matter, which is that we need sort of a new system to allow this kind of innovation to work. You could put solar and storage on your house, but maybe you have like too many trees around your house, and so, but maybe your neighbor or your schoolyard or whatever has a great roof. But right now, your neighbor can't put on extra solar and run a wire to your house or run a wire to three houses and create a little neighborhood microgrid because we're under the regulated monopoly system that Amy talked about. And obviously, I really appreciate the work Excel's doing. I appreciate the progress they're making. But I think if we think, those of us, we've all lived through the telecom kind of revolution, you can either have the solution the monopoly brings you or you can open up to the market, and now we all carry these things around that we call phones, but really they do, you know, a hundred other things and their compasses and calculators and every other thing. And that really comes from my perspective, from competition and from innovation, and certainly Excel, we want them to be in there too, competing and innovating. But I'm concerned that with a monopoly, we'll go too slow and the price will be too high. So this is, to be honest, in some sense, a kickoff of an effort to bring more market forces to bear in Colorado. And, and one, of, one of the thing about the right to store bill, just, it was, that was bipartisan support. So that's where the public policy there, both sides of the aisle liked it. It was uh, State Senator Steve Fenberg and then, um, shameless plug for my husband, State Senator John Cook, who, um, so Weld County, Boulder County, promoting this right to store because it, 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 for us it's, a, it's truly like a, a freedom issue, so. Great, thank you. Um, I hate to cut everybody off, but it's that time. Oh, you got five more minutes? Okay, we got, to, we got five more minutes. And we'll stay around if you have questions. Okay, who do you want to go to? Thank you so much for coming to talk to us. A, a quick question. So I have Tesla solar on my roof, and I chose not to get the battery because we've had consistent power. But I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the, the there is an environmental consequence, right, to creating those batteries and then ultimately disposing of them. So I wondered if you could talk, and just from a little bit of reading and talking that I've done to folks, it seems like batteries are an essential component of uh, almost any approach we would take to a microgrid. So could you talk a little bit about the environmental side of that and, and about the viability of creating batteries at the level and size that we would need to make something like that work in a larger sense across the country? Uh, sure, so in the US, batteries, mostly car batteries, are one of the real recycling success stories. Something like 99% of all lead acid batteries get recycled. So, um, so that's, that's old lead acid batteries, of course, which is lead, which is bad, and acid, you know. Um, the lithium batteries are, are sort of new. They're really, we, we haven't had to worry about recycling them too much yet. Um, and that's what, uh, so the, the two things that I will say about it, though, is, um, Unlike a lead acid battery that just sort of, when it dies, it dies, and you've probably experienced that in your cars, um, lithium batteries just lose capacity slowly over time. So there's, a, there's interest in, it hasn't really been worked out yet, taking those vehicle car batteries out of vehicles and using them for stationary applications like microgrids, because we don't care about weight anymore, but in a car you do care about weight. So that's to be determined. I'm sure, I, I, I have to believe it's possible, but this, it's not, there, we, there aren't that many batteries coming out of vehicles yet to, to really make it happen. Well, I, I was, 
One of the things I think on battery, I think we have a, a I mean, your environmental concern is, is spot on, right? I mean, there's still a mining and there's still that kind of thing that has to go on to get, to get the rare earth elements that are, that are needed for those, for those batteries. But um, I, I will say that this is just anecdotal. I don't know if you all know state, former state Senator Kevin Lundberg, the guy's totally off the grid, completely, 100%. Not, hasn't been for hasn't been on the grid for two and a half decades. He actually recycles all of his batteries. But I think y you'll find um, that right now, and Peter, you might be able to uh, to talk to this, is that small scale batteries like residential battery, that technology is much further along than say utility scale battery. Plus, there are issues with utility scale that that y you know, in the in the extreme weather, whether hot or cold, their, their um, efficiency declines. But if you have residential, I mean, your chances are you've got them somewhat covered. You're not going to see the decline in efficiency and the decline in, in, in um, lifespan the way you might with a utility scale if it, if it has to be outside. You know, I, I just, sorry, I, I just remembered you had a second question about scaling it up. And you know, Elon Musk got a lot of publicity about the Gigafactory, which is which is pretty cool. Uh, but there's actually several much larger factories under construction right now. So the battery industry is in this transition, and a lot of our clients are actually have trouble getting batteries because the demand is far outstripping the supply, and the 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 car industry is taking most of them, and it's a temporary problem. So. When, and, and it's happened in the solar industry as well, where, where prices stopped declining for a while just because the, they couldn't build factories fast enough, and th but then they caught up. And so we expect um, them to catch up and battery prices to fall dramatically when there's, there's several much larger factories under construction, or, in, mostly in China. Yeah, and again, uh, your, your question is, again, really spot on. Uh, great audience, thank you all. Um, you know, Everything we do has an environmental cost. And one of the challenges, as I see that the 21st century is this bigger question of how we build more of what is often called the circular economy. How do we take those batteries and recycle them instead of the one-way economy that those of us that are older kind of grew up with, where you take stuff, you use it, and you put it in the garbage, and then it's done. So we have both our mayor, who also runs EcoCycle during the day, and our city manager. I don't think the date has been set, but I expect there will be, there's going to be a number of kind of public events around how Boulder can help drive this circular economy. And this is one example. If I'm going to get batteries, how can I help drive the market, and how can the community help drive the market to make sure that they they go into a circular economy instead of a one-way flow through. So fabulous question. Please stay tuned. Listen for these city events that will be coming up. And uh, just keep asking those kind of questions, because that's part of what I believe we really have to do. I'm trained as a chemist and a biochemist. There's no free lunch. And <laughs> you, know, you can't create or destroy materials and blah, blah, blah. And so we really have to learn to live with those realities and be much wiser than we have been. So thank you. I just got the nod from the president. <laughs> I think this time I'm right. Yeah, time is up. So sorry, because I know we had a lot of other questions out there. Uh, so first of all, I've got to tell you, Le Leslie, Amy, and Peter, thank you for such an informative presentation. But I also have to tell you, even more so, I think it, it's just great to see folks from different parts of the political spectrum uh, who might, you know, you would think would have great differences, actually working together and collaborating to, to find practicable solutions uh, for real world problems. So thank you very much. And so in, your, in honor of each of you, the Boulder Rotary Club is pleased to contribute 100 doses of uh, vaccine to the Polio Plus Fund to end polio.